It's the podcast that shakes and stirs up pharmacy. Welcome to PBM on the Rocks. Is a happy hour actually possible with the topic of conversation that we're talking about here? <laughs> it's more of an angry hour. Oh, it's uh, funny you yeah. say that. Uh, <laughs> as we get happier, we, and by we, I mean one of us who bought a title for $50. <laughs> uh, on sale. I don't know who you're talking uh, about. <laughs> you know, gets happier and more self-expressed with the uh, the frustration that PBMs cause. So yes, it's, it's possible. I guess it depends on how you define happy. Jeremy, your background is killing me. <laughs> Get used to it. Wait till I so, start adding characters in. For everybody listening, uh, Jeremy is uh, pretend Versailles with... Um, I don't know what you're this, talking about. This is my this is my man cave. With his We've seen your uh, photoshopped onto a painting somehow coming off the frame. I'm not even sure how that's physically possible. But Monique, it's you're not classy. doing it justice. <laughs> <laughs> that classy. was a top classy. tier Photoshop. Yes. Uh -huh. No, nothing says happy hour like a like a man cave with that stuff going on in the background. It's very classy. <laughs> really. And thanks by I'm the way for dressing man. up for us. Anyway, so as we all know, we come together once a month to have a drink and to talk about all the things that have been going on with our favorite opposition, the big three PBMs. And by that, I mean, we hate them and we want to trash them because they're awful. And we do this because it makes us feel better. And Dr. Bach, we are so excited that you are here because really, for those of us in this world who've been doing this for years... Everything that you guys do, that your conversations, your communications, all the stuff that you all talk about, it's, it's entertaining, but it's also super effective. We are big fans of Julie's work. You have to love anybody whose blog is titled From the Broomstick of Julie Bach. I mean, that's just like... Well, Claudia has sort of been the mastermind of that. Kind of ah, stuff. I, Claudia. Congrats. Uh, my that's my job is just to care for patients. Great to have you. We're honored. We're just thrilled to have you. I appreciate that. And I hope, I hope I can say something useful here. I am having a cocktail though. I don't know. That could really bottom, bottom it out. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, yeah. Either that or it could help. Well, yeah. you never know. Yeah. Well, I was coming late to the party and I'm late to the dry January party. So this is a pretend Aperol spritz and it's also calorie free. It's made with Sprite Zero and that Aperol, not mocktail, but you know those um, spirits that are being, they're like botanical spirits that taste sort of like the thing. I'm not, now I'm not articulate. Now I sound like I have been drinking. <laughs> that thing. I can, it's like Ritual is the brand, but it's, it's really, really good. It's, it's um, the first time I tried it, I was like, oh, this is disgusting. Nobody will ever drink this. And now I drop it in like, like my water and my Sprite Zero. And it's, it's lovely. It, it's almost like drinking a cocktail, except not. Nice. Not Jeremy nice. Has, it has no alcohol. I know. Well, next month. We return to normal next month. And Jeremy, what are you drinking? You're normally like Mr. Jameson, aren't you? Yeah. Today I'm doing Parkway Get Ben IPA. It's from a local brewery. It's my favorite beer. I'm doing this one. I didn't want to do Jameson tonight because I got to go to a lunch meeting tomorrow. And if I do Jameson, I will probably still be drunk by noon. Good See, plan. I'm getting more responsible. Uh, with <laughs> your Versailles background. Yeah. Just wait, I'm going to chug like all six of these in 30 minutes. <laughs> What's the alcohol content of those again? The alcohol content is 7.2%. So yeah, it'll be pretty fun. Okay, yeah, you shouldn't be too hungover by tomorrow. I ain't no punk bitch. I got this. And then Shannon, you are, what are you drinking tonight? Technically, it's a red wine spritzer. But I decided to rename it in honor of the February episode. So this is a PBM kind of love. A little bit sparkly that goes away immediately on the top and dark, murky, and bitter underneath. Oh, that's good. You're right. This is the February episode. So I really mm -hmm. am playing the dry January party. Okay. Well, <laughs> the actual cocktail in March. Yeah. So Jeremy, what's the latest in PBM world? What, what are we talking about today? <laughs> well, the PBM world is everyone's getting fucking murdered right now. Like everyone I'm talking to right now, it's all the same story. Like we think that we individually, like no one's got it worse than us. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people out there that have it worse than us. 
like it is bad. People are shoveling in a lot of their own money to stay afloat right now, just to make inventory payments. It's awful. It's awful out there. Wow. So, and this is the the remnants of the well, no, it's not even the remnants. But we're at full swing of the GIR hangover we're now. We're full swing, and on top of all that, they've cut reimbursement so bad as far as reimbursement levels. I mean, it's it's not looking great out there, and we've got to press forward and we've got to try to get some wins for everybody like ASAP because there's not going to be a, a lot of people that survive this year. Like most of us probably will, but I mean, it's getting bad. People are, they're up against the wall. Like, and it's yeah. times like these where you get desperate that, you know, you never know what they're going to do. They might have to start cutting corners, cut way back. And before you know it, like the Indies are having to run it like a chain and that's just not us. Mm-mm. No, so we've been talking about this for some time, as as has just about everybody else in pharmacy. And the question really was, what was it going to look like? What was going to happen when we got to this point? And now we're here. So we know that you know a couple of, or at least we think, the evidence suggests that a couple of PBMs were starting to take their DR fees last quarter. And then a couple others are taking theirs the end of... Uh, 2023 this quarter at the end of this quarter so for some you know we were starting to feel it really pretty hard last year and not even really knowing why did we get hard stuff on that yet no we didn't we didn't you were the one that was really spearheading that on the early notification yeah, that, none of that's in our contracts yeah so all they did was prolong it like they they made sure that no one could get a cash reserve up to survive this mm-hmm that you may think, hey, spread it out's one thing, but if you're not prepared, you know, oh, I'm spreading this out and this is the time where I really need to cut back so I'm saving. If you're not prepared for that, then it could really screw you. Yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal, ma'am. And I am, you know, optimistic that we're going to get through it, but I am not optimistic that it is going to get better because we're hearing stories about fees that are being taken out under other names. Uh, same nonsense, you know, same thing, chapter and verse. Even when we catch up and we get out of the crunch, if reimbursement stays at this level, I think before year end, we may see more than the 25% that we're expecting will close. It's really bad. Yeah. Dr. Bach, do you guys, do you deal with DIR fees or, or is that, does that happen in your clinics? Claudia may have more of an idea than so I So we actually just had a bunch to where we ended up paying $4,000 back to Maritain after all the revenue came in. We had to pay for administering drugs. Oh. That's ridiculous. So, wow. Isn't that wonderful? So we terminated <laughs> our contract with Maritain starting April 30th. Yeah, we have a lot of, um, we have a real busy practice. We have lots and lots of people in there and we have quite a combination of different insurance companies and we've actually been dropping off a lot of different plans just because it's been ridiculous you know you have to (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, you know it would be great is if um maybe you could take a minute for the people so you're um you're not new to us we're all fangirls including jeremy of the stuff you guys do but um (laughs) fan lady (laughs) a second and just like uh you know, for the people who are listening, just share a little bit about, you know, your practice, where you are, what you do to kind of give our wider audience a, a feel for how, what it's like when even, even outside the traditional independent pharmacy sphere. Well, I'm a rheumatologist. I've been in practice for quite a while now. I um, started out employed by a hospital. Um, and then uh, uh, quite a few years ago now, I uh, left their uh, employment, started a new office, Started out in a small space with like four exam rooms and a ultrasound suite. And then um, it took us about a year to kind of get that all settled down. And then we um, decided to expand. So we took over a space and been taking care of people now for a um, pretty long time. If there was a time I was seeing about, uh, you know, maybe it's 20, 20 new people a, a week. Now it's a little bit down, not because there's not patients to see. It's just because I'm seeing more follow-ups than I used to see. Um, we had an interesting relationship with the people that make Cosentex. Are you familiar with Cosentex? Mm-hmm. So Cosentex used to be this drug that had some problems and we got them to make an IV version and we've been uh, 
one of the first offices in the U.S. to use that drug. And I'm a big believer in the IV versions of these drugs because of the compliance issue. Uh, there's a really, really major issue with compliance when you, particularly if you've got people who are already on narcotics and they're supposedly seeking treatment for their arthritis other than just to get prescriptions. Um, we have a lot of drive to get people on treatment. And then we have a lot more ground to say to them, hey, we're going to reduce this. We're going to change it and have them feel compelled to agree. That's exciting, though, to see that you have taken something and really turned it into a, a community hub for these patients, this health hub for them, you know, which, which is how it should be. And, yeah. you know, it's funny because like just a few days ago, I, so I'm in Arizona and we are about to launch just separate from PUT, the Arizona Independent Pharmacy Coalition, which is a group that I am part of. We are getting ready to launch our next round of legislation. And we've been really fortunate to be able to partner with the rheumatologists here, you know, because they have in different ways, but still pretty bad ways, they've been subject to some of the same system abuses that go on we were working on patient steering. This bill ended up getting tabled because of just technical problems that were going on that were beyond our control. But we were trying to deal with patient steering. We were trying to end the practice of brown bagging. We were trying to stop the white bagging. And I remember being in a meeting, a stakeholder meeting, and the lead lobbyist for PCMA. So for people listening, PCMA is the the opposition, the, the PBM trade lobby and their sole job is to hire people without a soul (laughs) to lie and do anything they can to stop any kind of progress anywhere and just at all. Right. And so this lead in the spirit of that, this lead lobbyist starts off the meeting by saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll listen to this bill, but we're just going to tell you right now, we don't think Brown bagging is real. We think you made that up. So we're not even going to address it. (laughs) One of the lobbyists, (laughs) <laughs> I got to say, I don't know what a brown bag is. I would assume that has something to do with the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, we had, it, it, I think that's a different, that's a different practice. If you well, don't know, Doc, Louis, you can't afford it. <laughs> in St. Louis, we have white bags, white bags. That's oh, the, but yeah, I don't know so, about brown bags. I, I honestly, like, you talk about lunch. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they'll just like do anything, right? Our, uh, the, the lobbyist for the hospital association said, she goes, well, I hate to inform you, but I'm a patient and brown bagging happens to me. They send me the medicine to take to your specialty pharmacy to, you know, have it administered. And, you know, it was just sort of like, so there you go, PCMA. We didn't make this thing up. I, but of course, they're going to accuse us of making stuff up because that's what they do, right? It's like, oh, we're going to make up that. The pharmacy industry is great and everybody's making millions of dollars and we're just here to stop that so that we can make millions of dollars, right? They just like the thing they don't say. So, you know, we've had the white bag um, situation in our office and we we just stopped participating in that a long time ago. We just, we just don't do it. Yeah. Okay. There's some things you just got to say no to. Yeah. Like yeah. I have people, especially like this year, they used to come in, they would demand like a certain brand of this or that and, you know, I take a little bit of loss on it to like keep him as patients, but now it's got the point where it's just like, listen, if you're, you absolutely have to come in and have this particular brand because you're not a fucking adult and you can't like the taste of this or can't swallow this, then you're going to pay out of pocket. We're not running insurance. That's just how it is. Like you got to start taking these stands. Otherwise, I mean, you're just going to get ate up by the system. Yeah. Fun fact, <laughs> Jeremy actually talks like that to his patients. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Mark, keep going. And do you deal with a lot of white bagging and brown bagging in Virginia? No, actually, we have not encountered that here anyway. And if you don't participate, it doesn't happen. We had a people that we know that were just overwhelmed with that, and they they didn't have any concept of what it was impacting their income with. And I think they've all they've all stopped it. If they haven't, it's just incredible stupidity. Because if you don't do it, it doesn't happen. There you go. Yeah, agreed. You know, on that note, that reminds me of the big news this week that Tyson has dropped CVS. 
as their PBM. The PBM that grabbed CVS's clientele is called right way. The right way to do it. Well, that sounds like me driving. I'm they always are, going the wrong way. <laughs> I think, Anne, aren't they a transparent PBM? I, I, yes, I think yes, Greg told me that they're part of the Transparency RX group. Yes, ma'am. So. Right. That's great, but none of the indies are on their network. So it's like... We are. You know, small we are. victories, I guess. You are? Yeah, I looked oh, up I the provider directory and we were there. Oh, okay. I don't know how that got tossed around online then. I, I don't yeah, know. I, you I, talk I, to your patient. for me. <laughs> huh. I, I think Falk said it. And when Fox says something, I think it is gospel. Like, oh my God. <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> but verify. Speaking of CVS, and didn't you just have an audit? Oh, sure. Oh, we yes. up the happy we had a lovely, lovely in store audit. Yes. 380 <laughs> prescriptions, I think. So yes. we've had since the beginning of the year or since the end of last year, Optum and Liven in store with CVS and now just a remote one from Humana. That sounds like a truly joyous occasion. Uh, it's been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had I just recently one. went through one and it was, I did great. They only got one script and it was like cream day supply. It was a bunch of BS, but man, yep. the stress of them. Like it's just, I don't deal with that crap well because it's just like they're coming in and they're just like micro focusing on just like, everyday stuff and you know that they're just looking to screw you over like it's a stressful event even though you know you've not done anything wrong and you've done everything up to that point it's insane but i'm also one of the people where it's like i'm not a rule follower in general but whenever it comes down to like that kind of level of judgment like going through the airport i'm like oh fuck did i bring a gun i don't own like <laughs> i'm like shit i hate it Puts me off my game. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't come in the store when the auditor was here because I was afraid that I would kill him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bach, do you guys have to deal with audits? We had an interesting experience not that long ago. We had a government opiate guy come up with a badge to the front. He has to speak to the manager. So he came in and he had specific cases of people with opiate scripts that had come out of our office. And he said, I want to see this. We pulled them all out, pulled that all out for him. Then I want to see this. We pulled that all out for him. So let's see all this, pulled that all out for him. And he got done. And um, I hadn't met him at that point. It was just all been done with my manager. And um, he was very complimentary. He, um, he said we were one of the best offices he had been to. And um, I don't know what that meant. He had seen a bunch of criminals and, and thought we weren't a criminal or, or what the hell. But it was really an interesting experience, though, because I was I, I was kind of oblivious to it when it was going on. And afterwards, when I talked to him, he was actually very complimentary and very, um, very positive. But you know what I really wanted to do is I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to say, hey, you got any ideas, any suggestions? What could we do? How could we make it better? And he had nothing. And I, you know, I, the only thing I, I, I said to him, one thing I asked him was, I've been hearing that the incidence of the opiate addiction is about one third of the population. I mean, he nodded and that was it. You know, um, the, the opiate DEA? thing is a gigantic. What's that? Was this DEA? I don't know. I think the, I think the government is, they're trying to institute restrictions on opiates and the reaction of the pain management and uh, uh, spinal surgery and, and just about anybody's doing any kind of surgery is they just eliminated opiates from their prescriptions. And the bummer in my world is we have a lot of people who are way past any limitation on that. And they, they're very established. So we have our current strategies and I'm always open to, you know, more ideas. I just, I was really disappointed. This guy comes in and spends a full afternoon with us and um, just says, you're good, bye, you know, and I was like. <laughs> no, you need to be very happy about that because they will come and hit you with a $10,000 fine for each instance of just misfiling something. They can really do some damage when they want to. Well, they didn't, they didn't have any reason yes. to give us any damage. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. I think that would have been a little disappointing. I think they should have come in and said something like, this is the nicest, most well-run operation we have seen in the entire United States. 
why aren't more like this one? You know, like when you go to that level of preparation, they need to really like level up and respect. You know what I mean? Well, we didn't have any preparation for it. It was just completely spontaneous. Okay. Um, yeah, he just they don't comes give walking you a heads in. up on those. They just walk yeah. in. I'm like, hey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and it was, uh, it, it was just an interesting, interesting experience. You know, another thing that I've just recently done, they've got a requirement for us to do a study on opiate use and how to, how to diet, you know, how to use opiates for, for pain management. And they really propose some stuff that, that I'm like, what? I mean, they're they're talking about immediate release opiates as being the number one drug. That's what we should be using. I'm like, we use a quite a bit of tramadol, and you know, honestly, I think tramadol could be over the counter. It's it's easily as safe as the non steroidals, and they have like one short piece on on tramadol, and it speaks of side effects, and and then everything else is is narcotics. Very, very strange. I don't know. There's a lot of things in, in the experience of the rheumatology office that is really troubling through the insurance issues that we deal with. And it creates a lot of, um, a lot of sadness for patients. But for the most part, you know, we just, you know, we do what we got to do and keep people as improved and healthy as we can. We've got an interesting mix in the world of rheumatology of people that have very straightforward things, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, real classic stuff. And then we also have people that are just absolutely obscure. Nobody can give them a diagnosis. You know, we're just trying to come up with what are we going to call this so we can justify treating them with certain kinds of medicines through insurance companies. And also, you know, what gives us a direction to go in? There's, um, there's quite a bit of that in our world. And this is crap we shouldn't have to navigate. I mean, we should be focused on like treating the patient, not having to worry about jumping through insurance hoops at this level. Yeah, of course, there should always be like a little bit of pushback. If like, okay, you're going overboard. We've got some other methods you may want to try. Maybe a little bit of pushback. But the level that especially you all are dealing with with prior offs, it's insane. Like we just give you like a heads up. Hey, this is happening. It's annoying on our end because the patients blame us. But you all actually have to hire people and do all of this nonsense to get it through. And it's it's frustrating and it's not fair. And you all are not compensated enough for that crap. We started our boycott for the NSAID. Um, the simple diclofenac, um, tramadol, those yeah. prior authorizations. Yeah, we've been getting some weirdness from from one of the companies about just basic drugs, um, methotrexate, folic acid. And we're just like, hey, this is, these are just the most classic, simple drugs. The reason we use them is because they're so well established to be so generalized in their potential ability to help people. And they're also the cheapest thing going. Why would you create a hassle and a delay on that? When you- because if you're looking at like so many patients and you just get to delay one or you get to, have them pay for just one a year out of all the patients that they handle. That's a huge amount of savings. And if they just go down and even if they're doing the cheaper stuff, they get to show all this growth to their shareholders. They don't care about the actual patient. It's they're finding new and petty ways to just nickel and dime everyone to the point that they can show, look at this growth. Like, and it's well, getting yeah. to the point that the people, we can't, like they can't squeeze anymore. Yeah. I think the insurance companies are set up to, um, they grow their employment with the concept that the management is better paid because they're running this place and making this all work. Very strange. I would call it a straight up fraud in the history of, I think, the world as far as when you're looking at amount of GDP. Like, it's insane. It is one giant racket healthcare is right now. And they get to call all the shots, especially now with the vertical integration. But even beforehand, it was bad. And now they have different arms to solve problems that the other arm is creating. That is what a mob does. Like you're paying protection money. (laughs) We've had some success with contracting directly to large employers. So like we have a direct contract with um, Edward Jones. These are uh, big businesses in our area. And, we've been able to point out to them that we can really save them money. And the, you know, the bummer is uh, there are just some people that are uh, more difficult to deal with either 
because of opiates or also because of complex situations that are not diagnosed and um, people have been in, treated poorly. There's a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. You'll probably see some of the patients coming through there with fibromyalgia diagnosis. And I just think that should be eliminated. I, they should not call that a diagnosis. They just call it a, a description of diffuse symptoms of pain. And then, yep. the, then or, and you could also include in it the other symptoms that people have, the, maybe the depressive symptoms, the insomnia symptoms. And you, you could just say, well, they got fibromyalgia, but that doesn't give you any FDA approved guidelines for what to treat. So um, I see people who have been labeled with fibromyalgia and it just takes me some time to talk to them. And I say, well, gosh, you know, maybe you have ankylosing spondylitis. Let's call it that. Let's proceed with treating you and see if we can make you better. You know? Have you noticed patients giving you a lot of pushback whenever you're just like, uh, you know, let's, let's not call it fibromyalgia because a lot of people like get attached to like certain disease states. Like it's some kind of like characteristic of themselves. And a lot of times you got to approach it a little delicately. And that's something I have problems with sometimes. Uh, <laughs> you can't be like, Hey, that ain't fucking real. We got to define it this way because what you're saying is nonsense. You got to actually be like, no, 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 no. What you're experiencing is completely legitimate, but we can't, we can't use fibromyalgia as like this all encompassing disease state because it's not going to work. Do you have any problems sometimes with like pushback with like patients? Well, yeah, way. you know, the, the majority of the time when we see people, um, they're coming to us because they need something, they need some help. And, um, if you, you know, take a look at fibromyalgia and FDA indicated medicines for it. I mean, you've got a couple of different SSRI drugs and you've got, uh, Lyrica and Gabapentin. And I've literally met people who have had, uh, like ankylosing spondylitis is most, that's the one that is the most clinically diagnosed of anything. And if people don't, don't recognize it and they just, they call people fibromyalgia, they might or might not rattle through those drugs, see absolutely no benefit and send them back to their primary care doctor and say, they take care of fibromyalgia. We don't do that. And then, then they go pain management and back surgeries. And um, I can reflect on cases of people who either have had multiple back surgeries and they're not doing well, who have, you know, have inflammatory disease or people that were on the verge of surgeries and we direct them to hold off, let's try some medicines and they end up um, avoiding the surgery. You know, and there are people like uh, who will do pain management uh, things with procedures, a little, you know, needle pokes and stuff and they'll get better. But if you have very chronic pain, the uh, pain management is just sort of evolved away from being helpful and they just go down the road of MRI and referral to surgeries for different sites. Yeah. Hey, Dr. You Dr. run into as much alternative medicine as I do. <laughs> You're very fortunate. It's yeah. very hard. Whenever I have someone coming in asking for homeopathic remedies, and I'm like, get the get your ass out my store, hippie. Get out of here. He's <laughs> like, That's not real medicine for your not. That's not real. You're drinking yeah. water. No, I gotta be nicer, yeah. and it's hard. Well, you guys know the story of you know the story of the old laws on supplements back in the early 80s before that no. they used to have a law that said that people who made supplements had to actually put what was in their supplements or else they're breaking the law yeah and amazing for, and for a supplement company to go to the expense of putting anything in there it dropped their profit so the government had this law and they were struggling with it for a really long time and this father and son team changed the world the kid came out of college and he said dad i did a study of all the vitamin c and there was no vitamin c in any of it and his dad said isn't that breaking the law and he goes yeah dad they've been talking about that a lot lately the government's really struggling with this you know i checked it out we could buy some vitamin c pretty cheap and we could really put it in the pills maybe we could uh, talk about that on the news and uh they ended up getting promoted you know this is before the internet national promotion of this kid who had identified this huge number of supplement companies ripping everybody off and they were going to put real vitamin C in there and they bought it and they did that. And it ended up getting taken off the market because it had a contaminant in it that made people ill. Wow. 
Um, so then the, what the government did at that time was a study of every kind of supplement out there. And they showed that a lot of the stuff that was very popular at the time didn't have any value, like vitamin C at high doses, no, no improvement in virus. Glucosamine was ineffective. And, you know, to this day, we see tons of people taking supplements and they'll be on vitamin D supplement and their vitamin D levels never come up. Okay. I think we all look like we froze because we're so compelled by what you just said. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, so that's we'll, the thing. So, so people the come in looking for supplements and herbals and stuff. And I'm like, listen, you know, you could try it. If it makes you feel better, that's fine. But don't don't think that it's going to be some kind of miracle or it's going to be great. Like you can get a good brand that even has stuff in it. And it's questionable whether it's actually going to like be efficacious or not. It's worth trying if you really want to. I'll sell it to you. Like, I don't see a problem with that. I don't carry anything homeopathic because I'm not going to do that. I'm just not. But, you know, if it makes people feel better and feel healthier and maybe the placebo effect gives them a little more energy, you know, I don't see a problem in that. Well, the principal you know, problem that I've the principal problem, the principal problem that I've seen is um, vitamin D deficiency. People go to their doctor, they're low on vitamin D. These guys go buy some vitamin D. So they come back and they're taking, you know, Red Rock, um, vitamin D, 1,000 units. And they check it. And like, You're not taking it. And it's, oh, I am. Look, here's the bottle. And they say, okay, well, yep. get 5,000. You know, I mean, the FDA, the FDA guideline indicates about 800. So, and then they come back again and again, and then they end up on 50,000 units of vitamin D2. And with the problem with that is that certain kinds of vitamin D assays don't pick up D2. So they, they just, um, they never see the vitamin D come up and they don't know what the hell it is. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of mixed vitamins. I use some brand names that I recommend that say, uh, take this, take this. And, um, and I, and I said, look, stop these supplements, try this mixed, uh, mixed multivitamin. They'll come back in three months and we'll, we'll be checking your vitamin D and see what you got, you know? For doctors to make that something of value for them to be constantly monitoring stuff that doesn't really do what it's supposed to do, that's sad. It's not, they need to move on from that. We need to be able to have it reliably corrected, fixed for a lifetime. I mean, you know, rickets used to be a fairly common illness. And um, I don't know when it was, so maybe in the 20s and the 30s, they finally recognized that vitamin D deficiency caused this illness. So they started putting it in milk. And it, you know, changed the world. The, the rickets um, kind of went away. Um, it was like scurvy, same damn thing, you know, back in the old days. The, uh, the, there was actually the, a kid, uh, my friend knew who got scurvy in college because he was like eating nothing but ramen because he was just trying to save a bunch of Murray. <laughs> Gave himself scurvy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember when I was in college and when I was living independently for a long time, I think I really wish I had taken some multivitamins on a regular basis because the kind of crap I would eat was just a joke. You know? Man, when I was in undergrad, the last thing that I was worried about was my diet and anything else. I was, I was just raging. But then again, I was doing that through pharmacy school too. So yeah, I wasn't really healthy <laughs> through my through my twenties. Well, I I about my retirement plan, which was to live on chips and salsa and margaritas. You know. My dear. <laughs> well, I think the salsa is pretty good. Maybe a we got the vitamins, right? <laughs> I've got my vegetables, right? Help me out, Anne. We've got carbs. That's, in there. that's still my standard diet. <laughs> yeah, lime juice with a scurvy. So I'm feeling mm -hmm. like I feel like my retirement plan's going to be pretty good. So <laughs> yeah, it don't matter to me. I'm immortal. <laughs> uh, Denial's pretty awesome. Not. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to sign up for one of them. Uh, cryo things that aren't going to work so that even when i'm not I'm like ha ha you ain't got me death fuck off oblivion jeremy's Death's coming back like, mm -hmm, yep come on <laughs> gotta have confidence oh, going off into the abyss <laughs> yep. yeah so earlier dr bach when you're asking do people get happy about this kind of stuff may i introduce you to jeremy <laughs> <laughs> i'm not yeah. even doing liquor today <laughs> Well, Dr. Bach, we here. never got to hear what you're drinking. This is um, some Tito's. It was on the rocks, nice. and the rocks have kind of melted away. And it's got a little olive in it, so a little olive's good stuff. Uh, nice. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my good friends. Is Normally, it's got blue shoes on. Yeah. Well, like you know what we do? Dog. We're going to ask Ann. Shannon's going to ask Ann in a second. But you know what we do is we put everybody's drinks in the show notes for this. One of these days, we're going to put forward the putt PBM on the Rocks cocktail book, which will be interesting based on some of the drinks people have come to the table with. I last month came with magic grapefruit juice and it was magic. It didn't, they didn't like wash the dishes, but it did taste like a grapefruit and an orange and somehow created a grapefruit, orange grapefruit. And it was marvelous. I have to get more. It was magical. I have to get more and send them to you guys. <laughs> I mean, they have... told me, my friends are like, it's like a magic grapefruit. I'm like, there is no such thing as magic grapefruits. Two months later, still talking about the magic grapefruit. I'm still waiting for my magic grapefruit you said you'd send. Oh my God. I, Where is my magic grapefruit? I'm like, I'm <laughs> I was wow. really looking forward to some of the pages like, oh, Jeremy's special eggnog, where it's bourbon and ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> that was also Jeremy's... Um, his yeah. uh, the de Mayo drink last year too, wasn't it? Bourbon. And oh yeah, it was. Uh, all my drinks are basically whiskey and ice cubes. <laughs> We're like everyone's going to come with a mocktail because it's 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 mocktail month, and then Jeremy's hey, like bourbon and ice cubes. But the King <laughs> Jeremy has a mandarin orange in it, so there's that's that. true. The King Jeremy does have a mandarin orange in Old it. Oh, Jeremy can get fancy too. And what? Are and you what? Are you fancy drinking? boy. <laughs> I am drinking a rusty nail. You ever heard of that? Mm. No. Nice. What is that? Drambuie, Johnny Walker Black in this case. But it's nice. poured into my very special, newly arrived PBM's Truth RX cup. Very proud of. And with that finger sticking straight up, looks to me like a rosty nail sticking straight up, waiting for a <laughs> to step on. This is Woo! A yes. Sounds like a That's Saturday great. night. That's a Jeremy <laughs> it does sound like a saturday night dr bach you are absolutely correct sir <laughs> wow that makes me so happy that makes me so very very happy yes dr bach we're gonna have to send you um one of our honorary pins that the design she's talking about is on dr bach this is the pin and this is that's what it. is on her mug that's it that's the one the middle finger yes sir, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I really don't need it's that. It's important oh. to use <laughs> sign language when you talk to the PBMs. They don't understand without the sign language. Think of it as a rusty nail. <laughs> I just, I just go, I just go. Come on, man. That's a, that's the only signal I need. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh man. You know, we were kind of founded originally by people that were just tired of being nice and just felt like saying it like yes, it was. And our, <laughs> our original founder could probably put jeremy to shame with his level of um with yeah, his could. Of wow. on the other hand he's now retired no, no, no. and going around the country following the grateful dead which was a lifelong dream and dream dave, we are so happy dave marley is dave marley yeah it is yeah. he's my hero Oh he's yeah, my absolute yeah. Hero. yeah, he's my hero too. Yeah, wow. I mean, look, he uh, wow he travels around now, and I mean, he retired, and he oh yeah, you know, but yeah, he's but so, is he banned from Twitter? No, no, he's not, and that is an honor that is reserved strictly for you because, as <laughs> tell it like it is, as put is, we haven't been banned from Twitter. That's Here because we don't banned. threaten things with arson. True. This is true. Nah, I'm back on Twitter. It's just the original profile. They won't unlock it, even though I've demonstrably shown that in their rules, what I did was not wrong because it was clear hyperbole. But they won't do it. He's demonstrated care. that he's several thousand miles away from the Caremark headquarters. I, on the other hand, am not. So all I said was I would delight in watching a mob burn it down. That is not me threatening anyone. That's me delighting in the fact that their headquarters burned down. Okay, maybe I was drunk as shit when I tweeted it, but it's fine. And nobody's hurt. But no, it's fine. I got my my other account. <laughs> Yeah, after that, we usually let right. Dr. Bach really make the clinical decisions, and then me and Julie are the ones that argue. He keeps <laughs> us all straight and narrow, <laughs> and then Julie and I are the ones calling out the mafia tactics. Dr. Bach's yeah. a good cop, and but 
the bad cop at the same time. You get him on the phone with a pharmacist that doesn't want to pass on, like, that wants us to prior authorize an eight-page fax for folic acid. He gets uh, riled up. Wow. <laughs> Claudia, were you the person that wrote bad the Twitter PBM account? on the letter? That that thing that Julie said is a bad PBM and it's got this unhappy face on it. That that just made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. That was actually, that was one of the most outrageous things. I, I, I've, you know, I'm just working away. Here. I've seen these patients, blah, 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 blah. And then I'm just, I'm sitting in a conversation and she's talking about how this insurance company is um, doing prior auths on folic acid, methotrexate. I'm going, what the hell are you talking about? What is this? And they, and I'm like, and I'm, I'm talking with this person who's there and, and I'm like going, what are you doing? And she's like, well, you know, we got to make sure you're not getting chemo. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You know, we just have these kinds of problems with these insurance companies. And sometimes it just, it's too much. Oh, yeah. it's, just too much. It's, it's the John well, Gresham. It's a John Gresham novel. The one where the life insurance company just denied. Yes. Request. It's that. That's what I say all the time. The rainmaker. Thank you. That is exactly <laughs> what this Thank is. You, Karen. It is. <laughs> well, Dr. Bach, you'll be happy to know. I went to a Christmas party year before last and one of the guests happened to be one of the doctors that denies the prior authorizations coming in oh. from the doctors oh my god and yeah and he so he didn't know me right so but I was like really so tell me about these prior authorizations and he was just so like oh it's really fascinating and I'm like but why do they get denied all the time he's like it's always the doctor the doctors think they know everything they don't <laughs> like, tell me all the time like it's the AI. It's the AI. Let's be honest. If you could see Dr. Bach's face right now for everyone who's listening. <laughs> all, my new statement that it's always the doctor. I, mean, I was just like, please if you all tell me see more about how the doctors shit. don't know what they're doing. I'm, I promise. And speak louder and into the flower, please. I mean, it was just very <laughs> like. If you all want to see some enlightening shit from people who like do that job, get on the pharmacy subreddit and read some of these people that are in the PBM industry, they're fucking terrible. They're awful. They go and they're pretty much like, they're doing this job and they're pretty much just trying to cruise through as much as they can while not actually putting in any work. And they're they're making money just denying patients care and they don't give a shit. And that, that goes for also like the docs and the NPs and everyone else that are on the other end. But the pharmacists especially, like it's it's disgusting that they are over there on the side of the very industry that's trying to destroy our profession. It's it's awful. And I get on there and I say that and I get banned for a few days. But uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty normal. The moderator- Julie just got me. banned yesterday. She got back on, luckily, because if she didn't have X, I don't know what she'd do, but she got banned on there for saying, listen, call me, Doctor. we'll pull Dr. Bach out of the room, call me, let's get this approved. But for whatever reason, they didn't like that. Wait, she got banned for that? Yep. They said she put her phone number on there and they say reported it for spreading private information, but it was her own cell phone number. Yeah, like, they do that. Oh. They'll flag it and no one, they're so overworked, they won't actually sit down and review things. They'll say, they'll just be like, no, nah, it don't matter. They don't care. Well, comment yeah, I mean, the numbers that we've, we've had reported is, um, you know, reviewers that are looking at, 14,000 cases a week kind of thing. You know, just it, it's just silliness stuff. Oh, Very strange. It is definitely silly and definitely getting out of control. Well, we are coming to the end of our drinks. Well, I know the end of my drinks, although I do have I do have water. So <laughs> still got some sipping here. Yeah, you yeah, you you take your time, enjoy that Tito's. That's good stuff. But uh when we bring our happy hour to an end, we always look for the thing that we are going to toast to. So, uh, what shall we? What shall we toast to tonight? What What's the thing that we can either laugh at or be excited about? Or let's toast to some good times for us all, and hopefully some success and seeing things get better in the future. I love that. Yes, let's drink to that. Everybody. Wow. Cheers. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. To learn more about Pharmacist United for Truth and Transparency and how you can help fight PBM abuse of our healthcare system, 
visit our website at truthrx.org.